So we've done matrix arithmetic and kind of get what we're supposed to know. Uh, we had equality. Uh, we're we're going to talk a bit about properties of equal, things that you can do that you'll still have the same systems of things that you've written down, which we'll get to the idea of al algebras once we get to that point. Obviously, we need to be able to add two matrices, which just simply says, take the positions that you see and add them. Obviously, they're the same size. An awful lot of this book will assume that as you start to write things down, it won't tell you that dim dimensions need to match appropriately. That's under, oh look, I saw it. Obviously the operator happened. It only could happen if it was the right size. So we have some assumptions that come into play as you do these. So we had one form of addition, the typical way of combining. We have two terms of products. The alpha A, where alpha is a scalar, just simply goes through it. Now, even though it's called scalar multiplication, physically, what would be another word for this? It's a distribution. The scalar distributes to everything within every equation, right? This is a system of equations. So it's a lot of times easier in your head, you know, when you do it, to know what is this doing and why, because it'll help you when you need to take it and do something new as we go through it. Try to think of the underlying op as you do it. Now, when we talk about matrix multiply, the easiest one to understand was the first one that's based strictly upon systems of equations, which was a matrix times, now if I write it that way, right, that's bold font, right, just putting double arrow. What's the thing on the left? Because I wrote a cap. It's a matrix. What's the thing on the right? Vector. It's a vector, which happens to be a matrix. Which type of vector, though? Rose, column. column. Rows, we put it, we say that way for rows. If, it, if you don't tell me the direction, we assume up and down. So I take an entire rectangular block of numbers and multiply it by a column. And we had all the interpretations of this. We could sit there and say things like, you know, A could be thought of as a bunch of rows. So A's first row, A's second row, A's mth row, and this is being multiplied by a column vector. And what happened was every row got the column vector. And this is the thing that was uniquely defined for our what we're going to do which is a row times a column spits out a scalar. So we call it a scalar product. Eventually this concept will be called an inner product, where we have a vector of one form and a vector of the other form spits out a single quantity. Right? And the single quantity in, a, in the end, we've used this before in Calc 3, this idea of a vector and another vector work together, a row and a column spit, spit out a single quantity. The single quantity is a metric. Right? What are metrics? They're scalars that re represent something. Like I say, hey, let's average everybody's grade. I would get a number. It's a metric of this class that tells you average. We could do other statistics, which spit out standard deviation. Right? We have the words. That single number has a meaning of some sort to the group of stuff. The inner product or the scalar product, eventually when we study this physically, has a meaning in terms of do they point or don't point in the same directions? Nine degrees, same way, maybe same direction but opposite. This metric will be associated with that, kind of like the angle between the two. But it's not an angle, it's a number that represents the idea. That will help when we leave actual vectors. We'll ask things like, hey, is there something that acts like a vector? So that understanding of what this new object is, we'll come back to it. For now, what do we do in this section of 1.3? You do it. <laughs> Matrix, vector, uh -huh. number. Uh -huh. no, get all the numbers. That's all we have to do. Can you do arithmetic? Because that's what we're talking about right now. Is can you add and multiply. 
Eventually we'll say why, right? And a little bit more about where they come from. But there's a physical question of it. All right, so that's one way of doing it. Another understanding uh, between this was, well, A itself and its vector can also be thought of, well, A could be thought of as a bunch of columns. So A's first column, A's second column, up to A's nth column. And the vector is well, a bunch of numbers. So a vector is well, it's a column vector. It's just number, 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 number. And what's a, what's a matrix? Column, 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 column. Now, I could think about it that way. This sort of multiplication does exactly what the inner product does, go across. But if I go across, a scalar times a vector is a scalar vector multiply, right? And then we would say plus. And so what happens is if I would go ahead and think of it that way, it's we would write scalars first, right? Now, if we would look at this problem, does the alpha really need to go in the front? I mean, you can distribute from the right. I could say A alpha, but it kind of looks stupid. We write things like 3x. We don't tend to write x3. It's like, uh, why? It's just what we do. <laughs> right, we put the numbers first. So we put the numbers first. It's just, it looks pretty. And so we'll put the number first just to do it. So I have the number, and then the column, and then the number, and then the column, and these all add up. And I get the number in the column. And I say, I take the column and stretch it by a number, and take the next column and stretch it by a number, and then I add them all together, and it makes a single column. And so that's a linear combination. So what is a linear combination? You take every vector and stretch it by a number, and then just stuff them all together, and you get a single vector. And so when we understand matrices multiplying vectors, we can think of it as two ways. One way to think about it is it's the rows of A, each scalar producting with the vector. Another way to look at it is the columns of A all stretched accordingly to that vector and then just put into one object. They both mean the same, they go to the same place. They're the same meaning. Once we understand that, we can go and say, hey, what does it mean to be matrix matrix. Well, a matrix matrix is actually a matrix with, well, B is actually a bunch of columns. So all this is is matrix, vector, matrix, vector, matrix, vector. In other words, it's what we've already done a bunch of times. And then you look at that, and that makes a column. What does this do? It makes a column. And so this spits out, if we just do each one of those one at a time, it ends up being that AB will spit out a matrix of appropriate size where every element of this thing is made up of taking A's row and B's column according to position. If I take the fifth row of A and third column of B, it'll spit out the fifth third element, right? Fifth row, third element of C, that one scalar. So all it's saying is, is that, well, you just do what we've already done a bunch of times. Again, what is 1.3 about? Do it. Do a lot of these arithmetic operators. Can you add, scalar multiply, and multiply matrices. Uh, two objects that are of interest to us for a second. Note. Two special matrices. The first one is the big O matrix. What is the big O matrix? The big O matrix is the matrix of whatever size you want in particular that you're worrying about. Say so big O, there's usually a size associated with it because it's a matrix, but importantly you use big O, it just simply has all zeros in it. It's the all zero matrix. So is there one big O? Uh, no. There's a big O for the size you're looking at right now. 
It's the all zero two by three. It's the all zero one by seven. It's the all zero, whatever you want. It's an all zero matrix. And it shows up when, when you need it, right? And at size of what you need it. Um, the second one is the I matrix. The I matrix is inside is normally called the delta IJ, where the delta IJs are either going to be are piecewise defined. They're either going to be one or zero. It's one if I equals J. It's zero if I does not equal J. Now, normally this is square. It's not required. It just simply says it's ones on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So what I normally looks like is one, one with zeros here and zeros here. If it's non-square, you would see possibly things like this. One, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, right? That still satisfies that operator. You just had all the extra stuff. It's just ones on the main diagonal. Um, typically, though, in most books, and in most times, and even in this class, is typically i is n by n. So it's going to look like ones, strict ones. Sorry. There is no all zero column or all zero row. Just ones on the main diagonal. So, all right, the reason why we use these is because they end up being special elements of what we talked about in 1.4 is matrix algebras. Um, the study of history and, and mathematics over time becomes a little bit argumentative and problematic, uh, mainly due to the issue of things get destroyed. Uh, typical writing things are done on things that are inexpensive for the culture. So. If you're in the Babylonian culture and you want it to last for a long time, there's something around you which is clay. And you can make clay tablets, and before you dry, you, you have a reed that you cut that has a little V shape, and you just start poking it, and you can form your written words and dots and numbers, and then you let it dry or bake it, and now it'll last for until you break it. And so the issue is, well, I hope they don't break, right? Um, but if you're in the Mediterranean, and the, one of the dominant cultures at that particular time would have been, say, the Egyptian culture. And they had reed, and they would cut the reed, and they would lay it out and make it flat, and then you would lay them against each other and press them flat. It would make something that kind of looked like what we would call paper, right? And it would look like things like this, and on the back side you had reeds like this, but on the side you were writing it would look like this. Now, if you were going to write, would you tend to write up and down or left and right? Left and right? Probably left and right. So that means if you would have cultures that had scrolls made out of this, because you could make it as long as you want, um, when they say things like, it's so important we wrote on both sides, what do you think the point they're making? It's like, it's hard to write on the other side. And so you're really paying attention. You're trying to, you know, usually it's, it's, it's a metaphor to say, hey, this is important. But on the other hand, if you had cultures, say China, where you had bamboo, that you would write on. You stacked it vertically, and then you would tie them together because they didn't stick to themselves. Which direction do you think you would write? And how's the rule? Like this. So nicely. Uh, but over time, we have issues. These tended to break. At which point, this all fell apart. At which point, how do I put it back together? What was written? I don't know. Uh, this tended to last. Clay tablets tended to last. Um, there's cultures that made, you know, just what was efficient within their have, and they had good writing, but we don't have it anymore because it was lost. So when people say, this is what happened over time, all right, this is what we've read about the people that we at least have stuff left over and stories of. 
But in the end, the mathematics behind this is it grew kind of all in fits and starts. And what's an algebra? And so you would look at you know, essentially what's happening from <coughs> India through um, the Arab Peninsula all the way through the Mediterranean. And these cultures conquer each other and do all these other sorts of things. And one of the things they have to figure out is, I don't know. Hey, how much land do I need in this shape if I want to trade with you in two pieces of land of that shape? You have this much stuff, I have that much stuff, let's barter. That's a lot of stuff. I need to represent it, how do we do this? And so they developed, well, problem solving. And if you would have symbols that represent your objects, and then rules of how these things did what you physically expect to happen, it's an algebra. When I say math is toys and rules, what's an algebra? The toys are the physical thing, but also a representation of the physical thing. So all of a sudden we start saying things like x and a and b. That's the beginning of an algebra because it is something, I'm just not going to tell you what it is right now, but it holds all the properties within it. And I think, well, what do you do with this? Well, add. Well, what are the properties of add? What can add all do? What can multiply all do? What are all the uses for this? The study of such things are algebras. And you start off with simple algebra based upon arithmetic of normal like integers and then you can go up to like advanced algebras and all the other studies of like what are the properties of properties and what's necessary so you'll learn things like boolean algebras and all these other aspects of things that you're working with and so for us what we call a matrix algebra what's going to be important here is this begins <coughs> the study of linear algebra which is going to be algebras that meet a specific concept of things. The easiest way to talk about this is like a Boolean algebra is the physical things you have are two. How many do you have? Two things. Sometimes in, if you're taking, uh, if you're a science major, zero and one, they're bits. It's logic, it's true and false. And then there's laws that are associated. Then you have two operators that combine two things to make one thing. You have one operator that makes one thing and makes a new thing, and then all the laws associated with it. We have something more than that. We'll have objects, and we're going to loosen it up a little bit. We'll have properties, and what are the laws associated with the operations? Addition and multiplication. And so for us, when we look at this, we know that we have things, and we're going to call those things, so my objects here are obviously going to be what we call a matrix and what I call a vector. And I have a symbol to represent them. Eventually, I will completely divorce the fact that that thing represents a rectangular block of numbers. <laughs> It'll be a thing that has a certain group of features. And what's a vector? Eventually, we'll even loosen that up to say things like, I why do we call it a vector? Because it represents a physical thing that says that way and is this long. Right now, for us, it's just a, it's a linear array, right? A, a linear straight line of numbers. Now, eventually, again, we'll loosen it. But for now, we just have those names. And then we have our, our operations, which are can I add, can I scale or multiply, and can I vector multiply? However you choose to define those things. So if I loosen up what A, B, and alpha, which is a scalar, right? So the other thing I forgot there, since it shows up, it's going to be a scalar. We're going to have to, if, if at any time I would reconceptualize what this means and then talk about those operators in different ways, you know, those one would be, say, vectors, that they do that. And it makes a new object like that. What's a scalar that takes a vector and stretches it bigger or shrinks it, depending on what alpha does? And what's the inner product here? Well, the inner product is going to be things that, like, how does that relate to same directionness? And if we do that and just rethink about these things, we would say, all right, time, what makes this thing an actual algebra that we're interested in? What's going to make this thing an algebra that we're interested in is if you have such things that you call objects and operations of this sort, does it meet certain laws? 
and the laws that we're interested in are the first one. Oop, forgot one. Forgot the transpose operator. Sorry. All right, the first law would be if you add two, it's the same thing and add them in the other order. What law is this called? Commutative. Commutativity. <laughs> so, have you run into commutative before? Yes. Yeah. What's a function plus another function? Function f plus function g is the same as function g plus function f. We use that all the time in calculus, right? On the other hand, is composition. Like composing functions. Put function f inside of g. Is that the same thing as taking function g and putting it inside of f? And it's absolutely not. You know, that's that wouldn't be commutative. Right? So some things are. So what we're saying is what you call plus has to commute. It shouldn't matter the order, which is pretty obvious, right? Because what is plus? You add the insides. But what are the insides? Scalars. So why is this commutative? Because 1 plus 2 is 2 plus 1. This is commutative because that is commutative. That's kind of nice. The way I defined it allowed me to have commutativity. All right, second thing. is if I take a plus b and then do a plus c, remember, plus only works on two matrices at once. So what if I have three? You better parenthesize and tell me who goes first. But on the other hand, it's rather nice that you have this law, which is called the what? Associative. <laughs> if you have the associative law, it says it didn't matter. Add in what order, any order you want. If you have the associative law, you could drop the parentheses if you want, if it's all plus. Associative law doesn't only work for plus, it also works for matrix multiply. But, note, associative law had to handle both, right? Because I had two operators. Well, why don't I have two versions of the commutative law? Because guess what? Multiplication is not. Here's an easiest example. If I would take AB, and this is 2 by 4, and this is 4 by 7, just size, All right? that would multiply. What would happen if you tried to change the order? I can't even multiply it. Right? It's obviously not commutative. So there is no commutativity law. But what does happen is if you have one way of looking at this, if you have an A operator that is associative and commutative, you don't need parentheses and you don't even need order. If this was just a bunch of pluses, it would say add in any order you want. Rearrange them however you want. If you want to do the first and the last first, go ahead and do that. You're free to do that. I mean, using that property is rather useful. So if we have things like this, you could say 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. That's hard. But 5 plus 5 is easy. Right? You just use the property that I can do it whatever order I want. And so you can take advantage of these laws. And that's the whole point of the laws. You use the laws to do the work. If you don't have numbers or things like that, we call it like simplification. Oh, this is this is this. Oh, I like the last version. I'll write it. It's expression work. Here's the fun part for you guys. How many years did you guys spend on what we call elementary or college algebra? Years, right? You had all oh, these group of symbols become these group of symbols become these group of symbols. And why did they do that? Because we have all these laws and I doubt somebody ever sat down and said why you could do it. They just said do it. Right? And guess how many days we're into what? This second week? And all of a sudden I'm introducing all of the algebra. And by next week, after this weekend, I assume you can do it. And it has all the laws and even all the names. 
<laughs> and everything else. Oh, I can rearrange. I can do associativity. I, if I wanted to, I could replace it in which order I want. I really don't need parentheses in Y. On the other hand, what happens if you mix operators? What if I want to multiply a B plus C? Here's a question. If I would take this and move it through, what's it called? Distribution. distribution. That would be 3 times X plus 3 times Y. Here's an important feature of distribution. Just so if you, when you go to other algebras, right? 3 doesn't go in. 3 and the operator <laughs> go in. That three times on the outside go in together. It's three times goes to the x. Three times goes to the y. So three times x, and I still have my plus. That hasn't changed. It distributes. But on the other hand, in algebra, if you would have gone that way, what do we normally call it? Factor. Oh, I factored out the three. No, you factored out, you factored out a three times. But <laughs> let's call it factor out three. But really, what did you do? I distributed just backwards. It's called the distribution law that hasn't changed. So what, is, what does factoring mean? It means this. You should be able to go forward, and you should be able to go backwards. So that means if you have a matrix and these other matrices, if you want to go forward, that this is actually AB plus AC, you should be able to go forward, and you should be able to go backwards. But we actually have a problem. Does this problem become different if A was on the other side? Absolutely. Why? Matrix multiplication is not commutative. If it's on the right, it's always on the right. If it's on the left, it's always on the left. You don't get to swap it. In other words, what happens? This and the operator goes through, and so this is now BA plus CA. Completely different, right? If, you, if it distributes in from the right, it must stay on the right. If it distributes in the left, it must stay on the left. You do not get to switch the order. This is horrifically important. You must understand this. It's the co most common mistake, people to start switching order. Because you've done something in your head. A lot of times people say things like, hey, if I had x times 3 plus y, well, that's 3x plus xy. Right? Because what did you do in your head? That's x3. Why did you write 3x? Well, because I know that in scalar multiplication is commutative, and I like to write numbers first. All right? You can get away with it here. Here? Uh-uh. <laughs> if it's on the left, it stays on the left. So don't get caught up in elementary algebra, college algebra, is not linear algebra. It's an algebra, so there are things that are kind of sort of the same. But they're completely different operators. They're completely different laws at different times. Some things have a law, other things do not. And we're really bad that we use the same symbols. Because if you see things like this, The symbols that you see here, which is the non-written, there's a symbol, multiply, are not the same multiply. The top one is a matrix-matrix multiply. The bottom one is a scalar-scalar multiply. Looks the same. Ah, figure it out. We do this all the time. Read context. What are you supposed to be doing? So we need to be able to have left distributed, right distributed, Let's go back to the associated question. What would happen, on the other hand, if I took a scalar and a scalar and then multiplied by a matrix? So I took 7 times 5 and then got a new scalar and then multiplied by the matrix. Um, could I have rather have worked with the matrix first? And the answer is yeah. If you wanted to, you could have taken the number and multiplied it by the matrix, made a new matrix, and then multiplied that new matrix by alpha. Is everybody okay with that? So, and on the other hand, I also could, can those be flipped in order? Yeah, because scalar multiplication is commutative. I could have put the alpha on the A and then multiplied by beta. 
So it's up to you too. You still have all the other laws of the types of things you're working with. All right, seven. What if I would rather had tried to take a scalar multiple after I had done a matrix multiply? <laughs> take a matrix times a matrix, get a new matrix, and then take that alpha and put it on it. Could I have rather taken the alpha and worked on the matrices? And the answer is yes, you could. If you wanted to, you could take the alpha to A and then multiply B, or taking the A after you multiplied the alpha and B. I have a lot of non-written symbols. What is this symbol right there, that dot? What does he represent? He represents scalar multiplication. It says the thing on the right better be a matrix. And then you take this alpha and put it to every element. Um, what does that dot represent? Matrix multiply. It says matrix times matrix. The thing on either side of it better be a matrix. So we have to be careful when you write things down that you're writing them correctly. You could write down things that look okay, but are absolutely wrong. They would make absolutely no sense. So these are, they're not strictly an associative law, <laughs> but it's like there's this idea of grouping on how things happen. Um, another one would be, I could think of another type of distribution. What if I would add scalars and then multiply that new scalar by A? It ends up being that it works out like you would expect. Whoops. Scalar multiplication, the matrix distributes in from the right hand side. So it does like you would expect. On the other hand, is that also true if I would try a scalar multiplication if I first added two matrices? And the answer for that is, yep, it actually works here too. So distribution involving this type of, why do we have all these associations and distributions? Because we actually have two types of products. Matrix matrix, what we call a multiply, and a scalar matrix, what we call a multiply. All right, what about if they involve transpose? What if I would transpose a matrix, which means switch the rows and columns, and then I switch the rows and columns? What should happen? You've done nothing. <laughs> so, hey, switch the rows and columns, and then switch the rows and columns again. Okay, you're back at where you were. So a transpose, transpose does nothing. Um, what does the transpose do to a scalar multiply? You could transpose the matrix first and then scalar multiply. Because all it's doing is switching the rows and columns, right? What is scalar multiplication? It's distribution. So if you pull the alpha off and then switched, everybody gets the alpha. Oh, look, either everybody gets the alpha before or everybody gets the alpha after. It really doesn't matter. It's not doing anything to the insides. It's taking rows and columns. In other words, the numbers aren't physically number changing. They're positional changing. Rows become columns and columns become rows. What would happen if I would add matrices and then try to transpose them? All right, what happens? If I add, I'm just adding their position, so I overlay it, and then transpose is I switch the rows and columns now. Well, that would also be, let's switch the rows and columns of A Let's switch the rows and columns of B and go ahead and add them. One way of looking at this is that's kind of a distribution-ish. Okay, and it ends up, for us though, this one's important. Rows of A, columns of B are multiplying to form scalars and then I switch the rows and columns of the end result. 
which means row column switches concepts. If that's true, this is going to act like B transpose, A transpose. So the transpose goes in, but it switches the orders of the rows and columns, right? Because think about what matrix multiply means. It means take the rows of one and the columns of the other. Transpose. Oh, that means the rows and columns concept switches order, which means we switch order. So we have to be careful on that one. That's the only one that would jump out and say, darn, my intuition was wrong. Because I think most people's intuition was put T above. It's like, nope. Think about a little bit harder <laughs> about what matrix multiply does. So these are laws that are associated with all these things, which would mean that I could give you a, a large expression, and you should be able to write equals and go for each of those things and start replacing stuff until maybe you got something that you liked. So this allows you to do expression work. Here's an ex what's an expression? An expression is variables and objects, which would be actual true matrices with real values and vectors with real values, with plus matrix time, scalar time, and transpose all mixed up. What do the laws allow you to do? Start working. Replace things with what they're equal to. And usually it has a purpose. Make it look better, factor out, things of that nature. And be careful when you try to apply things from college algebra to this, because it's a different algebra. Don't assume that something, this is where teaching it in such a way that it's just simply do what I show you and do what I say without understanding what you're doing makes this class difficult. When we say things in the following, say proof. To prove something is really to show the statement is true. So for example, you know, you can take an easy one. Uh, A plus B plus C does indeed equal A plus B plus C. Right? So showing something is true is called a proof. And to show something is true, this is supposed to be true for all possible matrices, right? Since this is all plus, we could assume without loss that everybody's of the right dimension. They're all m by n, right? or else the addition wouldn't work. And then you would have to show it works. And so you would go through here and say, OK, well, what does this mean? Well, the first one. So we start off with normally when you want to show an equality, you start off on one side and do equals until the other side shows up. Well, what does plus mean? That means I took aij plus bij, and that formed the matrix, and then I'm going to eventually add c. But by the way, that is a single matrix. Well, um, how do you, since this is a single matrix and that is a single matrix, how do you add matrices? You add their insides. So this should just become a single matrix of the first one, which is AIJ plus BIJ, plus the other one, which is CIJ. Hey, look, a single matrix. Now, what is this? It's a normal scalar plus a normal scalar in parentheses plus a normal scalar. Does normal scalar addition have the associative law? Is 1 plus 2 plus 3 the same thing as 1 plus 2 plus 3. Yes, normal. Now, now we're borrowing something I know. If I'm adding real numbers, real number addition is associative. That means that parenthesis doesn't need to be there. Since that parenthesis doesn't need to be there, this, is, this could also be thought of as what? I could have rather just AIJ plus, and we could have rather parenthesized, let's do the Bs and the Cs first. But what operator is it to add the inside? That's matrix B plus matrix C. What does it mean to add A? Matrix A. So what is this? This is actually A plus B plus C. That's the idea of the proof. We've used the definition of what 
addition is to show the left is the right. I've shown it is always true. Now, proof versus an example, which sometimes is used, you know, some people might use the word verify. In other words, show that a law works. Like I could try something like this. Um, that 1, 2, negative 1, 0, added to 3, 0, 1, 1, and then I'm going to add 2, 1, 1, 3. And I would compare this to 1, 2, negative 1, 0, and then have first added 3, 0, 1, 1, and add 2, 1, 1, 3. Now, what should happen for both of these? They better be the same. Add the first two matrices and then add the third matrix. If I added the first two matrices on the top, what would I get? Let's shrink this down to make nine. So the first one should become what? It should become four, two, zero, one, and then I'm going to add. Two one one three, and what do I get? Six, three, one, four. Okay, but if on the other hand I would have added these two first, this would be one two negative one zero, and then adding what? Five, two, four. And when I finally add that, what do I get? Six, three, one, four. Same. Big surprise! <laughs> I verified the law. Did you prove the law? No. You just showed that here, here is an example that happened to work. Can you prove something by example? No. Unless the question was this. Find an example. <laughs> if you ask me to, I want you to find an example, you've proved, you found an example. But more, normally it's show this is always true. Hey, it worked for this, it's true. No. <laughs> it's like, that's not how you prove. You have to prove it without actual numbers. So why does the book have you do a bunch of numbers? And why do you doing examples can give you intuition to trusting or it's essentially a mental experiment. These things should work. Why? Start doing it. Start doing some, you know, get intuition to be able to do the arithmetic. The examples are mental experiments to help you get a better understanding to develop intuition. Because that's what intuition is. You do something a bunch of times, you have a good feeling about what might happen. Is it always that way? Maybe not. All right, you have to be careful. It's not always. It's not a proof, unless the proof is again find an example. There are times where we ask that. So there's all those sorts of things that we can do with it. Um, also, uh, we can introduce a new operator. which is we have the associative law. If you have the associative law for products, you can get away with the following. Um, to actually do, for example, if you wanted to do A and multiply A, you would need a parenthesis to do those. And if you want to multiply A, you would need a parenthesis after you've done those two and then you multiply the third, right? And if you want another A, you would need a parenthesis, right? It gets a little old. But parentheses are required because it only works, multiply works on only two objects at a time. You gotta tell me which two objects you're gonna work on. So we do parentheses. The associative law allows you to do what? Drop the parentheses. And so because I have associative law, which means that if as long as I don't switch order left and right, I can reassociate by parentheses all I want. And so then I could <coughs> use a simplification of notation, which is you wanna do a bunch of A's, and you want to do, so for example, k times of them, just simply say a k. In other words, what is exponentiation? It's multiple multiplication. Have you ever helped somebody with algebra and they ask this? 
why does the two go on front and why does the two go on top? <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? I'm adding. Are you adding, like, go to, like, several things. X plus X plus X, right? If you are doing multiple additions, that means multiplication. I have 3X. Shorthand, X times X times X. I'm doing multiple multiplications. I don't want to write that all the time. I want to be lazy like I was lazy here. I'm going to put a 3 there. Why? Because I'm doing multiple multiplications. That's what exponentiation is. You help people like in introductory high school level algebra, they always struggle with the symbols and why you're writing it that way. And it's like, no, we're, we're, we have a reason for this. I'm lazy. That's, that's why I'm writing it this way. And powers are written this way because we're lazy. I want to do it a bunch of times. Okay. Done. But the moment you do this, it becomes an operator, which is called exponentiation. Now, this is really, really important because you need to be careful. Do not confuse exponents of algebra to exponents of matrices. Because exponents of algebra allows numbers like half. But half has a very oddball meaning. <laughs> what does it mean? It's a square root. It's a shorthand for a question. What number times itself will give me an x? By the way, here, only ints. No negatives, right? What's x to the minus 1? Well, that's 1 over x. Wait a second. That's the division operator. Do we have a division operator? No. We have multiply, add, scalar multiply. Do not confuse. Right? Be careful. If you have something up in the matrix, it must be 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever. No negatives, no fractions, nothing except 0 to infinity by ints. It just simply means multiply. Okay. So those are the laws of these guys. Now it comes for a classic issue for most people. What in the world is an identity? And what in the world is an inverse? Identities and inverses are always tied to an operation. It's an identity and an inverse of a operation. So examples, that, you know, previously, right? So let's say we talked about function composition. The idea of an identity is a do nothing. Under my operator, what literally, what object will do absolutely nothing? So functional composition is to put things inside a function, right? So function inside, I'm going to put in a function here. And just for the sake of being lazy, I'm going to call it i. So that nothing happens. In other words, the original function has not been touched. I'm going to take something and stuff it inside of f, and the f is a function doesn't change. Just eyeball this. What function is this? It's the function x. What does the function x do? It's a pretty obvious do not. What's a function? It's a thing that maps stuff. Can you think of a mapper that does nothing? Yeah. How about move 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, 4 to 4. You've done nothing. That's literally what that function does. Under composition, this is the do nothing mover. Just take everything, put it back where it was. Then what's a inverse? The inverse is the following. If you did something, I wanted you to do nothing. So for example, you had the number x, and you do something to it. 
according to a function. I signed it. Okay, wait. So you had these you had these things and you applied sign. Yes, that's the function I applied. I didn't want you to do that. I wanted you to leave it alone. So the question will become what can I apply to this function so that nothing would have happened to x? Anybody remember what we normally call that function in calculus? We usually call it the arc sign or the inverse sign functions. Why do you think it's called the inverse sign? Because it's the inverse of sign. <laughs> I mean, it's the undo, right? It's the inverse. Hey, I applied sign. I didn't want you to do that. Oh, I, I need to apply the, the inverse function for this to have not done anything and now x happened. We have that for all operators. Multiplication for numbers. Five times what is still five? One. So the, the, the identity <coughs> is unique. It's a thing. Five times one is still five, right? An inverse is not unique, it's a process. Hey, I took the number x and I multiplied it by five. I wanted you to do nothing. You took five and you multiply. I didn't want you to multiply it by five. Oh, I need to turn my five into a one. What would do that? Five's inverse. What's five's inverse? One fifth, because it would make it a one. But it becomes a process, right? It's a way to find the inverse of something so that nothing has happened. It basically wipes out it. But this actually adds an interesting issue. Do all things have inverses? Do all functions have inverses under composition? Are there invertible functions and non-invertible functions that you learn in calculus? Yes, there's certain things you can inverse. You usually look for what? Things that pass the vertical line test are called functions. If you don't pass the horizontal line test, you are not invertible. It's not a one-to-one -one and onto function, right? Which means no inverse. I can't take this function and undo it. So in the same way, is there anything I could multiply x by so that after I did it, I couldn't undo it? Yeah, multiply it by zero. Why? X is gone, I just have zero. And that's the issue. It's like, where, what do you have? Well, I have 5x. Oh, I know how to undo that. What do you have? Zero. <laughs> I don't know what you had before. I can't undo it multiplied by zero. It has no inverse. And the same thing will happen here for matrices. So if we talk about things like matrix addition, A plus what would still be A? Can you think of a matrix that I would add to A so that nothing happened? How about the all zero matrix? What am I going to do? I'm going to add zero to every one of those elements. OK. <laughs> it's, so this would be called the additive identity. It's the additive do nothing. It's a matrix of all zeros. <coughs> and I'm just, is everybody okay with me saying additive, but really meaning matrix additive? And you can tell because it's matrix addition. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if that's the identity, what about the inverse? The inverse is this. A plus what would do nothing? What could I add to A so that I get all zeros? Negative a, which is really what in terms of my operator? Take a negative 1 and multiply it by all the values of a, and then add them together, and I'll get nothing but zeros. Is everybody okay with that? Notice inverses are a process, right? Now, what happens a lot is in algebra, like we had that 5x, right? You had the 5x. How do I get rid of the 5? I multiply it by 1 fifth. What's another way of writing 1 fifth? 5 to the minus 1 power. What is the additive identity? Uh, <coughs> negative 1 times a. Sorry, inverse. Negative 1 times a is how I inverted it. 
how do I invert 5? I took 5 and take it to negative 1 power, which really means just make it a fraction. Just flip the fraction over, right? And so since the negative 1 shows up all of the time with a very specific purpose, we use it a lot of times as a label. Sure, sine's inverse function is a new function called the arc sine. But how do we sometimes write the arc sine? We put that minus 1. Is that a power? No, it's a flag. It says this represents an inverse. It's not a power. It's just a label. Which, if this causes people all sorts of issues, which it does, that's why we write arc sine. It's an entirely new, they could, should have called it inv sine for inverse sine. Maybe make it a little bit easier for people. So for us, at this particular point, we're going to move on to matrix multiply. And it ends up that we restrict ourselves a little bit. We're going to study square matrices. I would like to find a matrix that does nothing, which is going to be the identity matrix, which is why it's called the identity matrix. One's down the diagonal, zero's everywhere else. It's called the identity matrix. Why? It ends up being that it's the multiplicative identity. And when you do it, you know, if you would write things down where I do like A11 and multiply this by 1001 and just test it out, right? Why does it work? Why does having one in, on the diagonal do nothing? Because what happens? On your first multiply on this one, you just leave the thing alone. But what happens to everybody else? They get wiped out. In other words, you just keep the one in the position you want it. That's what this does. And so the, the identity is this. Now my goal that I want for the inverse, so you could verify it, it has it in the textbook, and you can play around with it with different examples. But for the inverse, I would like to take A times something and get the identity, and it better go the other way as well because an identity better be its identity, right? In other words, they're identities of each other. Who's A's identity? This. Who's this's identity? A. So they'd be able, they should be able to multiply in either order. In other words, this is yours. Like one-fifth is five's identity. Who's, sorry, inverse, erg. <laughs> five and one-fifth are inverses to each other. So you could ask questions. Hey, who's one-fifth's inverse? Five. Who's five's inverse? One fifth. They're paired. They're married together. And how do you find it? You reciprocal it. Take it to the negative one power. Now we are not at this point have anything on hand to find inverse. All we have at this particular point is I can show inverse. By what? Multiplying. I multiply one way, I multiply the other way, and I get the identity out. They had to have been inverses. So all we can do right now is check. Now our notation for this, so we can simply check. If I take A times B and I get the identity, I take B times A and I get the identity, we would simply call B to be A's inverse, and we usually don't write it that way, we would write A inverse. This is not a power. This is a label. It's the special matrix that when I multiply by A, either direction, they're inverses of one another, the identity comes out. Is everybody okay with it? This is not a power. So for this part of the homework, when you look at it for 1.4, all that's happening is you're just doing checking, 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 checking for all of them. Now. We have a little bit of issue. Eventually we want to get to the point, and we will get to finding one. Does A have an inverse? Well, 
Is it possible to not have an inverse? Well, think about normal other things. Like, do all functions under composition have inverses? It's like, no. If they're not one-to-one -one and onto, they're not going to be invertible, right? So the same thing is happening. Like, well, why? And we'll look at algebra a little bit. An idea behind that would be something like this. If we talk about normal elementary algebra or college algebra, we had that 3 times x can be undone. I take 1 third times that 3 times x, and that's 1 times x, which is just x, right? 3 had an inverse, but because 0 times x is 0, it cannot be undone. It completely destroyed it. So that would tell me that 0 does not have an inverse. And when I mean this, I mean multiplicative inverse. So what about matrix algebra? I'm going to have A times B. And I said, you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> you took B and you multiplied by A. I didn't want you to do that. Now, it comes down to, does A have an inverse? Now, this is, this is a particular question. If A does have an inverse, where would you put it? <coughs> Since order matters, I'd have to put it on the left, so it actually applies to A, right? If I put it on the right, it would make no sense. So we, aren't, we don't have that yet, but it will get down to, again, what's our idea is, is A times B ever going to be a big O matrix. If it becomes zero, obviously something bad has happened. Because if you destroy stuff, you can't undo it. I need to have this be invertible, right? If you make everybody zero, or all these things zero, you can't undo this process. There's an obvious answer. What if A is zero? It's like, yeah, that'd be not invertible. <laughs> the all zero matrix will not be invertible because it will destroy things. So that's pretty obvious. What we will find though is that there are some matrices that are not all zero that do this. So A is not all zero, B is not all zero, but A, B ends up being zero. Which should, should be the first time I like, really, really throws out, like, this is like against the law of what you've done in everything in college algebra, right? Everything in college algebra, how do you solve polynomials? You have things like, you know, x squared minus 4 is equal to zero, that's x plus 2 x minus 2 is equal to 0, therefore x is equal to negative 2, and x is equal to 2. What, did you, what, what advantage did you take of? The only way you get a 0 is if you have a 0. And that's what we did. What does this automatically say? That's not true anymore. <laughs> you have something that has non-zeros, you have something that has non-zeros, but when you multiply it, it's 0. I'm not going to be able to undo this. And so we're going to have words for this. So there's no way that these things, if anything that does anything like this that destroys it completely, I can't undo that process. So it won't have an inverse. So it's completely against what we've already fundamentally understood. It like opens it up, which is somewhat okay because, you know, you think about it, this is a bunch of numbers. <laughs> a bunch of numbers with a bunch of additions and multiplications and another bunch of numbers. There should be a possibility that if I multiply these, I just get a bunch of zeros. There should be something possible here. Um, so if something like this happens, it would mean A has no inverse. And we're going to pick some definitions here.
A is singular or non invertible if it doesn't have an inverse. These words and this idea is based upon what you see up above. If it's possible to multiply and get a zero out of this, it's a bad thing. And so I need to give it a name for being bad. And the name is singular. Think of singularity. What do singularities do when we normally think about it in sci-fi? You know, it's like, ah, I crushed everything, right? Think of it that way. This crushes things. So that's bad. It makes things zero when it's not zero. And if it crushes things, if it is singular, no inverse exists, so it is non-invertible. So that's our label for bad, singular. On the other hand, if A is not singular, in other words, it doesn't crush things, we also call this invertible. If it does have an inverse. In other words, A inverse exists. <coughs> Sorry. So we're at this point of we can't we have we don't have enough math yet to show something is either singular or not, which would mean if it's singular, no inverse, it's not invertible, that's a bad thing. Oh, it's not singular. That's a good thing. It'll have an inverse. And we don't even have enough to be able to find it. What we'll learn is a process where we need some tools that will start to do things like, what would it mean to find it? What would it mean for the inverse to exist? And as we do that process, we'll get us the idea of how to actually go about showing it. It's kind of like the same idea. When does a function have a composition inverse? It needs to be one-to-one -one and onto. How would you do? How would you show that? On a graphic, horizontal line test, I mean, that'd be an approach to it. All right? There has to be a process of some sort, and then we have to get to that. But we don't have enough math yet. We just have the idea. Don't be bad. Right? <laughs> don't multiply and make things zero. That's bad. You've crushed things, you're singular, no inverse. I can't undo this now. So for now, all we have check a b equals i b a equals i. If we say yes, then b is a's inverse. 